am very thankful today that we are serving an awesome and mighty God. And I want to speak to you today, and uh, the sermon title that I want to use is Speak a Better Word. Everybody say that with me, Speak a Better Word. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we would speak a better word? And I appreciate Chris for sharing that song, the last song there, that talks about our words. And today, I, I hope that you won't just hear this sermon and let this sermon pass you by. Whether you realize it or not, we are in the dressing room getting ready for the wedding that's going to take place. And let me tell you, not just anything is going to get in this wedding march. When you plan your wedding, not just anybody comes in. You know, you send out this thing called an invitation. You send it to all the people that you want at that wedding. And you ask them to let you know that they're coming back or that they're coming to that wedding. And so today I hope that you won't just hear this word, but that you will let this word sink into your heart, that you will let this word begin to do a transformation and a transition, that you would let it transform you and transition you to another position in Jesus Christ, that you would be different when you leave here today, or that your thought process about how you speak would be different. I want to begin reading in Psalms 139, 14. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I appreciate my brother for getting on my sermon. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. And in Proverbs 18, 21, death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it, listen to me, will eat its fruit. You're going to eat the fruit of the words that you say, and Sarah and Andrew, the words that you translate or help get translated through doing your part. You're going to get to eat some of that fruit one of these days. And let me assure you, these are powerful words from God about me and you. Think about it. Made in His image, body, soul, and spirit, with tremendous power in the words that I speak out of my mouth. Whether I'm creating life or I'm creating death, I don't think we fully appreciate the power of these verses or understand the consequences of how life or how we live, move, and speak in light of these verses. There are consequences to the words that we speak. There are so much consequences to the word we speak that one writer said, God put a guard on my mouth. We need to ask the Holy Spirit to guard our mouths. I didn't fully understand or grasp the power of this word until the power of my words were brought to bear in my life. When the Holy Spirit convicted me of my words, I started to justify what I said. But, you, but God would not have any of that. Well, you know, Lord, I, we do that with one another when we're talking. Well, I'm not talking about... You know, we begin to justify the words that we speak. But let me tell you, God is not going to let us justify the words that we speak, the words that we release, because we are created in His image. And we have some of the same power to create biologically and with our words that He had. We need to be careful what we're creating. Instead of the Holy Spirit letting me slide, He brought conviction. And I'm in the process right now myself of trying to dismantle through prayer and repentance the difficulties that my words have created. We never think about that the words we create, the words that we speak create challenges in our life with our spouses and with our children and with our work and with our friends and with our enemies. What we speak creates a world that we live in, but we don't believe that. Words are important because they reveal your heart. They reveal your heart. Our natural predisposition with our words is toward death. We tend to speak more negative than we do positive. 
been my understanding in seeing of people and being around people. The tongue is the servant of the heart. The tongue, listen to me, church, the tongue never speaks at random. The tongue is only the measuring stick of the moral man. When our hearts are diseased by sin, it is truly advertised by the mouth. You didn't hear me or you just said amen or oh me. Our tongues do not speak at random. They don't just start flapping. Their tongues are the measuring stick for what our hearts are like. Mm. When our hearts are diseased by sin, it is truthfully advertised by our mouth. This applies equally to the written word that we put on Facebook and Twitter and social media. Our tongue is at work expressing our hearts. Do you ever read before you push post? Might do you good to edit sometimes. Or maybe that's just how you are. I would be sad of that too. It is nearly impossible to speak to others without revealing our emotions, whether they're joy or sorrow, gratitude or anger. When you speak, all of those emotions are wrapped up in the words that come out of your mouth. When you're excited, you can tell in the voice. When you're angry, when you're, when you're upset, and all of those things come out of the mouth because that's what's in your heart. Mm. Help me, God. The tongue's power is primarily exercised in the spiritual realm rather than the physical realm. It targets the soul of men and women and boys and girls. Either we're edifying them or destroying them. The tongue is so powerful that these are a weapon or a tool of grace that Solomon said that life and death are wrapped up in my tongue. That is how powerful your words are. Solomon, the wisest man there was, said that life and death are wrapped up in this thing that is in between my teeth. That tongue gets loose sometimes, but it is only revealing my heart. It is only saying what is on the inside of me. It is revealing my true nature that we can hide until the right button is pushed. But when the right button is pushed, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. When, that, when they're on that last nerve, the real you stands up in full display. And we justify that by saying, I'm tired, but you. No, it's not them. It is you. We need to set a guard on our tongue and on our mouth and be very careful what comes out of it. Psalms 57, 4. My soul is among the lions. I lie among the sons of men who are set on fire, whose teeth are spears and arrows, and their tongue a sharp Sword. I've had people tell me, boy, I can tell you off with my, I can tell, I can make you feel like about you're about that high without ever having to do anything to you. Some people, we call them silver tongue devils. Some of you may not have heard that, but I've heard that term a lot. Some people let their mouths go. Let me tell you, our tongues can be sharp as swords. They can do more damage to the body than, and in the emotions of man than can the sword. God gave us tremendous power in our speech. The power that he has to create. Think about that. Do not take this out of context as so many people do and start trying to claim and for, with cars and trucks and homes with the words. that Don't take it out of context. We're talking about the context of the humanity of man, about living this life that God has given us and about being responsible for what you and I begin to allow to come out. We're talking about the content of my heart. It flows out of my mouth and it tells the world who I am, not who they think I am. And who they know that I am most of the time. You're not this way most of the time. If your tongue reveals that's who you are all of the time. You just keep it on the porch. Oh, you didn't hear me. 
It's when the right button is pushed is who you really are in Christ and who you're really not in Christ. When that guy cuts you off on the road and you call him an idiot. I've read the book. Nowhere in the book does God give that description to something he created. I haven't found idiot and moron in there. But I've heard it used a lot. That idiot. That moron. God says, I did not create anybody by that title. You assigned that. He said, I did not assign them that. You assigned them that. And because your words have power, they do damage or they build up. I wonder what God thinks when you call someone that. Well, I tell you what he thinks. He's not happy with it. He's convicted me about, hey. I called somebody an idiot one time, and he told me, he said, that's my son. I'm trying, like I told you, I'm trying to dismantle what my tongues have done. I'm trying to dismantle that. I'm asking the Holy Spirit to help me through discernment, dismantle this world that I've created to live in, because I'm not happy with it. He's not happy with it. Folks, we've got to get ready to go somewhere. And it's not, it's not the Walmart. we got to get ready to go to heaven. I never thought much about this until the Holy Spirit started con- to convict me by the word. I realized that God hears every word that I speak or think. You know, we don't realize that if we would keep in our mind that God is listening to the conversations that I have, even when nobody's around and I'm just blessing the air. He's listening. Mm, Boy, am I the only one that's been to the woodshed? This was a hard message for me to get. (laughs) Well, it wasn't hard to get. It was easy to get, but it was hard to dig out. Because I didn't like what I was digging. I didn't like the field I was plowing in. It's It's a tough field, Lord. Hear me today. The words that I speak have power to give place to an attitude in me in the spiritual realm and with power to create something wrong on the inside of me. If I keep speaking those words that are not right, eventually something wrong is going to form on the inside of me. Let me tell you something. The devil is a long game player. He plays ball for the long haul. He will watch you and follow you all the days of your life. Trying to twist his little here and twist his little there. And, and boy, I tell you what, that's why God sent the Holy Ghost. You know, God sent us the Holy Ghost so that you and I could have the Holy Spirit on the inside of us that he might lead and guide and direct. You know that small voice when you say something or do something and that voice says, you shouldn't have done that. Do you know what the Holy Spirit is saying? Go back and make it right. Turn around. That's wrong. Mm. Let me tell you what the devil knows. And he would love to get a hold of my tongue and our speech because he knows that there's been tremendous power given to man in the realm of words. We must be careful because reckless words carry more weight than you can imagine. There are few things more important in Christ and the kingdom of God than the power of the words, and the devil knows this. That's why he's always trying to push the right button and get you to say the wrong thing. There's a lot to say about the words that we speak, as well as about the power that you and I have when we speak those words. Tony, the next three verses real quick. Proverbs 12, 18. There is one, there is one who speaks like the piercing of a sword, But the tongue of the wise promotes health. Your tongue promotes health or not. Whoever guards his mouth and tongue keeps his soul from trouble. Not trouble, troubles, plural. Lots of things. Yeah. Lying lips are an abomination to the Lord, but those who deal truthfully are his delight. So let's go back to the first one, Tony, and let's look at it again. This, if you guard your tongue, you'll keep yourself out of trouble. 
Next. It promotes good health or not. And it's a delight to the Lord. Our words are a delight. If we let our words be a delight, they're a delightful thing to the Lord. Everything that exists came about by words. Think about that. In the most deterministic chapter in the Bible, Genesis chapter 1, verse 3 through 10, we see so much happening through words, and then God doubles down on it and says, I'm going to create man in my image. Give me the Genesis 21. Then God said, let us do something very profound. He began to speak. He said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good. And God divided the night and the darkness. God called the light day and the darkness he called night. So the evening of the morning were the first day. Then God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters. And let it divide the waters from the waters. (sighs) Dry ground just happened. I I hope they made a documentary of that. I really do, because I want to see that when I, when I get to heaven. I want to say, I, I'd like to see the earth that was dark in form and was, uh, was without form, and it was ugly. And, and then when I look at it, and, and I've had a chance to travel through some of the states and some other places in the world and see the beauty that God did. And he just said, let there be, and I want a garden over here. He said, I want a garden in Hawaii and Guam, and I want the tropics, and I want Florida, and I want Texas, I want deserts, and I want mountains. I want all of this. And I'm going to create people that like that kind of stuff, and they're going to flock to that. And he did that. Thus God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was called, and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven. So the evening and the morning were the second day. Then God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together in one place. There's an ocean over here and a lake over there and a stream over there. I'm just amazed. But I, when I read that, I just get... I just am amazed by it. I'm sorry I'm rambling now. And God called the firm in heaven so in the evening. Then God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together in one place and let the dry land appear. There was dry land, and it was so. All of this, you get in the pattern of what's happening there. God is saying, let there be. Let there be land. Let there be oceans. Let there be lakes. Let there be a firmament, let there be a heaven, let there be stars, let there be moons. Let there be all of those things. And it was. Now give me, give me Genesis 1.30. Also, to every beast of the earth and to every bird of the air and to everything that creeps on the earth in which there is life, I have given every herb of the food for food, and it was so. He created us. He created a food chain. He created all of those things. And he blessed it. And then, Lord, he made us. Somebody said, what was he thinking? (laughs) After a while, he said, what was I thinking? It's in the book. You go read it. It repents me that I made man. Well, you have, you and I have the power of words. When God speaks, it is so. And when we speak, there is consequences for our words. Our words are very significant. 1 Corinthians 14, 10. There are, it may be, so many kinds of languages in the world, and listen to me, and none of them is without significance. Every language is without significance. How dare us to categorize some people as more important or less important than others by the language they speak? Y'all still love me? I like ribeye. (laughs) I know a good place. Our words can either edify, or they do. They, They edify, identify, and multiply. Edification. Let's look at that for a moment. We can use our words to build someone up. Edification has to do with what we cultivate in others. It is not difficult to see the difference between people who were nurtured in their childhood and people who were put down. People who were nurtured are very self-confident. People who were always put down, they always feel inadequate.
Raised in that house, raised in that house, on the same street. But the words they received were very different. Identification. God called it good. <laughs> Bondage in life is often the result of the way human words identify a person. We identify people. I've heard some of us identify people. You know they've always struggled with. I don't think they'll ever get over this. They've been dealing with this. Ever, I've, I've known them for 40 years. They've dealt with this for 40 years. We've identified them and that as synonymous with each other. They're always going to have that. Don't, don't do that to people. Don't identify them as a drug head. Don't identify them as, as less than of value because of the way they may act. You know, you do like some people better than others. I mean, I do. I mean, that's just a fact. I like, being, I like all people, but some people I like to be around more than others. I mean, some people I'd rather go to coffee with. We have like interest. If I go to, if I go to, to dinner, to lunch with somebody who, who is uh, just a blatant sinner, we don't have a lot to talk about. I have a friend who, who uh, went to college, and he went at the same time that I did, and I love getting together with him, and our wives aren't too keen on it because when we, we go out to dinner, me and him are sitting there talking theology. We're talking God stuff. We're just, we're, just, uh, we're just wrapped up in all this, and we can talk and talk and talk and talk about that, and our wives are sitting there going, I wish they would hurry up. Because we're interested in those things. So we do like to be around other people more than some. But that doesn't mean we are to classify them as less people because of that. Words that build create confidence in a person, person's life. And words that depreciate people bring them down and make them feel inadequate. Multiplication. God blessed what he created. The Bible says God blessed everything that he made. And everything he blesses has his characteristics. It multiplies life. Ask yourself, what are you multiplying? Are you multiplying life or death with your tongues? You have the power to do either or to do both. And sometimes we do both. It multiplies life. This is what you and I are called to do, to edify, to identify, and to multiply the way that God does. God has given us the power to give life in two ways, biologically and verbally. Think about that for a moment. We all understand the power of our sexuality to produce children when we get married. We all understand that. But we are also called to, account, to accountability of the power of the mouse and the words that we produce. Proverbs 18, 21 talks about the power of life and death is in the tongue. Matthew 12, 36 and 37. I'm trying to hurry. But I say to you that for every idle word... Men may speak, they will give an account of it in the day of judgment. Do you think somehow you're going to stand before God and not give an account for the words you've spoken? Do we, do, do we honestly think that we're going to stand before him and not give an account? But I say to you that for every idle word that men may speak. You know, we justify that six ways from Sunday. You can't justify that scripture. That scripture says the words that we've spoken, we're going to give an account for. God never forgets the words we speak, and he hears every word we speak. And let me tell you, the devil does too. On the day of judgment, for by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. Now, how do we get away from that verse, that verse of scripture? We repent of the words that we have spoken. This is telling us that in judgment we will give an account for the words that we have spoken unless those words have been brought under the blood of Jesus through repentance, we will stand and give an account. What does that mean? It means you might ought to go back and begin to think about some of the words you said to people and write them down on a piece of paper and begin to try to unravel that and to repent. I'll just use a blanket statement. Forgive me for all the words I've said. I wish it was that easy. Maybe it may not be that easy. You might need to go back and write down some things. I know I've got a, I've got a long list started. And what I did is I categorized them. I put words I've spoken in my family, words I've spoken on my job, spoken in my friends. I put down the, the negative words that I might have said in some of those places that I could remember. And I'm going back right now through the Holy Spirit, and I'm trying to dismantle that. I'm asking God to forgive me and to unwrap that and give me an opportunity to change what I have spoken into existence that I am now living The devil stands and waits on our words, Psalms 39.1. 
I said, I will guard my ways, lest I sin with my tongue. You think the devil's not standing there ready for you to sin with your tongue? Oh, he is salvitating. I will restrain my mouth with a muzzle. <laughs> Some of us, no, never mind. <laughs> While the wicked are before me. You know, that's talking about lighting somebody up with your words. You, you know what that, when I use the term lighting somebody up, we're not supposed to do that. The devil will try to get us to speak the wrong things, hurtful, painful words. He will even give us the cause and the occasion. He will present the cause and the occasion for you to lose it. Do not fall for that trap. Proverbs 30 and 32. If you have been foolish and exalting yourself or if you have devised evil, put your hand on your mouth. I love the way that the writer writes some of this stuff. When I read it, it makes me laugh. Just put your hand over your mouth. If you can't stop talking, put your hand over your mouth. Put a gag on it. Put your hand over your mouth so you can't speak anything. Ephesians 4.29. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth. But what is good? For necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. My, my goodness. Now, for the next few minutes, I want to just talk to us a little bit about what can I do? What can I do if I've spoken words that have created a mess in my life? What can I do? You know, when the Bible tells us to examine ourselves occasionally to see whether we're in the faith, I believe that God expects us to sit down reasonably and responsibly and begin to think about our life. Think about what we've said and who we said it to. Allow the Holy Spirit to help me and to convict me and to draw me aside. And as I put things on paper, you know, you may, uh, when you and your companion are having heated discussions, <laughs> arguments, you know what those are, right? Nobody has those. Sometimes we say things we wish we hadn't said. You ought to write that down and go back and unravel it. How do I do that, Pastor? Well, you simply write it down and say, Father, this was a word that I should not have spoken. I ask you to forgive me for this word and help dismantle what I have created. You say, well, you know, we're all good now. Really? Push that button again and see if you don't go right back there. Push that button again. All the words you've ever said, and they'll tell you all the words you've ever said. So really, are you good? No, you're not. You know why you're not good? Because the Bible says you're going to give an account for every idle word, and you hadn't went back and repented of those. I'm, trying to, I'm talking to a church today as a, with a pastor's heart. Listen, I'm not perfect in this. I've got my list. I've got several lists. I've got my family list, my work list, my friend list. My enemy list, I got them all down there, and I'm, I'm putting words under them. As the Holy Spirit brings them to me, I'm writing them down and going back, and when I feel like I've got them repented, I'm crossing them off so I don't have to deal with them anymore. I don't want to deal with those things. Right now, you may be living through the pain of what you was produced by the things you said years ago because words do not die. It doesn't die. And can I tell you something about the spoken word? You can never get it back. You can apologize for it. You can repent over it. But you can't get that word back. It's gone. <clears throat> if you're in that place, write down the destructive words that you have spoken. To you, And you fill in the blank, whatever it is. I mean, you, you, I've told you what I'm doing. And pray this prayer in Psalms 41.3. Chris can amplified version, Tony. Well, we'll read it first here, and then we'll go to Amplified. Set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth to keep watch over the door of my lips. I want to read it to you in the Amplified. It brings a little power to it. Set a guard, O Lord, before my mouth and keep watch at the door of my lips. Set a guard. Set a guard over my mouth. It would be good if all of us would pray and say, Father, put a guard at my mouth. It would be good if we would learn the art of putting our hand over our mouth.
But when we're upset, our words reveal what's in our heart. Man, I'm working on that thing. The Bible says, who, who can know that wicked heart except the Lord? It is a wicked place. And then, it go, and then in James it says that my tongue is, well, it's set on fire by hell. I like what James says because it says, who can tame it? You know, you, you can put horse, bits in horses' mouths and rudders on ships. Let me tell you who tames that, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit tames that. Speak a better word. The Holy Spirit speaks a better word. That's why he sent the Holy Spirit, so that you would begin to take on the characteristics of God. We think the Holy Spirit is just speaking in tongues. Oh, my, my. That is... That is only the evidence. What really tells if you've got the Holy Spirit or not is how you live, how you speak, how you move, how you deal with, how you're willing to repent and to say, I'm wrong. I've had the Holy Spirit convict me, just wear me out. And I want him to do that because I want to go to heaven, church. I want to go to heaven. I don't want to preach all of my life. That's what Paul was talking about. I don't want to be a castaway. After I have preached the gospel, after I have lived the gospel, after I have suffered, have you read the story of Paul? He said, I myself do not want to be a castaway. I don't want to be thrown away. After I've done all of those things. So I challenge you today. To get you a notebook. If you don't have one, come see me and I'll, I'll, I'll give you one. I keep that book hid. So that I can go to it on a regular basis. Would you stand with me, church? This morning, if you're watching online and you do not know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, I want to give you an opportunity to invite Him into your life. Simply say, Lord Jesus, I am sorry. I realize that I'm a sinner. And I ask you to forgive me of my sins and to come into my heart and cleanse me of all unrighteousness. If you will pray that prayer and believe in your heart, your sins will be forgiven. For those of you that are here in this room with me today, if you need the Lord Jesus Christ in your life, and you want to invite him in to cleanse you, would you just raise your hand? Anybody in this building would like to invite Christ into their heart today? If you're here with me today and this sermon has convicted you about the words that we speak or if you're watching online and you're convicted by the Holy Spirit of the words that we speak, I challenge you to allow the Holy Spirit to deal with you and that you would begin to go back and unravel what your words have created. Created with your spouse and your children and your friends and your extended family. It is sad to me to think and as a pastor it is my responsibility to bring to bear reality. I can't tell you that everything is wonderful all the time. It is a challenge to me to think that we can be family through blood and not speak to each other and go to church and expect to go to heaven with those people. I'm not sure how that works. I'm not really sure how that would work. Oh, I'm sure that it won't work. Allow the Holy Spirit to convict you. You may not remember every conversation that you've ever had, and that's not what I'm calling us to do, but I am calling us to do inventory, to look inwardly, to ask God to help us, to transform us, and to change us. Join me as I do that on my journey from earth to glory. Can we pray together? Father, we're so thankful today for your tremendous grace and your mercy. Lord, I love you today, and I thank you, and I praise your name. 
I thank you, Holy Spirit, that you have been searching my heart lately. You've been touching me in places, God, and dealing with me about my speech and about how I live and how I don't live. Father, I ask you today that on this journey that you would lead me and guide me and direct me and help me. And Father, I will be careful to praise you and to give honor to you all the days of my life. I love you, Father God, and I pray for my congregation that I have. I ask that you would bless them and that you would put your hand on them that you would lead them and direct them and keep them by in the palm of your hand. And God, for this, I'll be careful to honor you and to give you praise. If you're in this room with me today and you want to come and spend some time in the altar and pray, the altar's open if you'd like to just come and kneel and talk to God a few minutes about who you are and what you are and what you want to be in Christ Jesus. The altar's open for any who would like to come and spend a few minutes praying. Thank you for coming. Respond to the Holy Spirit all over the building. Just respond and come and spend some time in the altar talking to God about those very things. Your love, a robe of righteousness. 